Mm-hmm. I think we'll go ahead and start. So, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Jean Marc. I am the co chair of the India Working Group for FIX, and my uh, representative here, as well as the other co chair, Pramod, can wave. <laughs> uh, I just want to say welcome to the November 2023 uh, FIX panel discussion on industry priorities for trading. Uh, our topic of the day will be on market structure T plus one to T plus zero, the rate of change of India's trading environment and then updates on the FNO environment and of course, Gift City's future roles. Uh, before we start the panel, I would just like to give you guys a brief intro on who we are at FIX and what we do. The FIX community is a nonprofit industry driven standard body for the heart of global trading. Our membership includes over 280 leading financial services companies, including asset owners, buy side, sell side, as well as stock exchanges, regulators, and of course, solution providers. A quarter of our membership is in Asia Pacific and Japan alone. The organization is an independent and neutral, dedicated to addressing real business market structure and regulatory issues, impacting multi-asset trading in global markets through offering standardization, delivery, operational efficiency, increased transparency, and reducing costs and risk for all market participants. As an industry-driven organization, all fixed trading communities initiatives are pursued in response to institutional trading practitioners, requirements and requests. We have a different working groups and different committees focusing on various aspects for the trading life cycle. For example, the exchange and regulatory committee, fixed technical committee, a post-trade committee. We also have a very attractive target groups such as the Asia Pacific uh, ETF working group, digital asset working group, and also our new algo trading working group. We will be announcing the Fix India conference for this year, for the 21st of March, 2024. We will also be holding the Asia Pacific Trading Summit in HK. We will also be summit, uh, supporting the Singapore Fix Conference and the Australia Fix Conference coming into the beginning of the year. Um, as the Fix Working Group, uh, as the Fix Working Group co-chairs, myself and Pramod are welcome to ask any questions and inquiries uh, for being involved with the Fix Trading community. So please come and ask us after the panel. Starting with the panel, we will have a little app called Slido. If you guys just want to take a photo of this one, if you have any questions related to the panel near the end, you can submit your questions there. And from there, we'll be able to answer them or bring them up to the actual panelists. First person I would like to introduce is Vikas uh, for the country business manager for GLEIF as he talks about what LEIs mean to trading in India. So very good evening, everyone, and uh, Many thanks to FIX community, first of all, for providing life this wonderful opportunity today. I think uh, to set the context, uh, what I've seen in last one year in my extent with life is that LEI, the Legal Entity Identifier Code, has been widely you know, uh, complied with because there is a mandate directly coming from RBI and now there are mandates coming directly from SEBI. So uh, I, I, I feel, I think it is the correct opportunity wherein I will make you all aware a bit more about how LEI can be used in your current processes. And I'll try to give you a bit of a background that how this LEI system came into existence. So uh, to talk a bit on the background of the LEI. So LEI actually came into existence in 2008 after the financial crisis, the Lehman weather collapse. So the public authorities across the globe acknowledged that their, their, their inability to identify party to the transaction, financial transactions across the globe, across the region and across the products. So G20 in November 2011, Keynes Summit have asked and called upon FSB, Financial Stability Board, 
which is also one of the international regulator, which provides its recommendation on the financial stability across the globe to develop a recommendation and create a framework or governance structure, which can create a global LEI system. Subsequently, in the year 2012, in the last Carbo summit, FSB submitted a proposal and it was endorsed by G20 in the leader's declaration. In the year 2014, GLIFE, which is a non-profit foundation, was created, which is backed by G20 and overseen by a regulatory oversight committee called the ROC. In the year 2012, when G20 endorsed it, in the same year, ROC charter was actually endorsed by the FSB along with the G20 finance ministers and deputy governors committee. So if you look at the structure, so GLIFE is a three-tier structure, which is actually overseen by a committee called Regulatory Oversight Committee. And I said, it is a consortium of public authorities across the globe. Currently, we have around 65 regulators, which are part of the Regulatory Oversight Committee, which has around 23 observers from 50 countries. So ROC has uh, uh, supervises and frames policies around the LEI system and global legal entity for, uh, identified foundation life is actually tasked to promote the awareness around LEI and the adoption of LEI across the globe. Clive has created a network of LEA LOUs, which is called the local operating units or the issuers of LEI across the globe. We have around 37 uh, accredited partners who are issuing LEIs across the globe. Uh, to name a few, we have few stock exchanges as well as like London Stock Exchange, NASDAQ, uh, Euronext and uh, Tokyo Stock Exchange and companies like Bloomberg are also issuers of LEI. From the Indian market standpoint, LEIL, which is a 100% subsidiary of CCIL, is the first LOU, which is from India. NSDL is also in the process of accreditation. We have around 2.5 million LEI already issued. Now I'll talk a bit more about LEI as a standard. So LEI is just not a code which, is, which has to be complied because of RBI circular. There's a bit more than that. So LEI is a 20 digit alphanumeric code and which is itself an ISO standard. It is an ISO standard called ISO 17442. If you want to have more details, you can anyway search the standard and read more. So probably just to give you an example, I've, I've taken a snapshot of our uh, global LEI index, wherein it shows the LEI of National Stock Exchange. And if you look at the screenshot, it shows two levels of information. One is the level one information, which shows you the business card information. And the other aspect to it is the level two information, which is the parent and ultimate child relationship, who owns whom. So LEI is not just a compliance which you have to adhere to. You can anyways access our global LEI index by going directly to the website, or you can also consume our APIs and get all this information. As I said, our objective is to collaborate and is to provide you a entity identifier which is interoperable and interoperability can't be done until unless we collaborate. So what we have done at life is we have entered into a collaboration between all the major identifiers which are well accepted in financial market. Like you, you use big code and big code issued by SWIFT. So we have done a cross mapping arrangement with SWIFT, big and MIC. We have done an arrangement with ANA and uh, ANA, uh, you know, uh, is the main body which is actually which manage uh, various NNAs across the globe. There are around 29 NNAs which has actually adopted the cross mapping arrangement. And uh, in India, from Indian market standpoint, SEBI and IFSC are the two NNAs in India. They haven't yet adopted the standard, but uh, the mapping arrangement, but they might also do that. Uh, we have also done a cross mapping arrangement with SNP and Open Corporate. It means if you go to our database and you search an LEI code, you will easily get the reference of the ISN which is issued against the LEI or the big code or make code already issued. Talking about LEI <clears throat> in the Indian regulatory landscape. So RBI, as I said, the regulatory oversight committee, RBI is an active representative in the regulatory oversight committee from India. Similarly, we have representation from uh, ESMA, SEC, PBOC and various other public authorities. 
but rbi has done a wonderful job in terms of adoption of lai in india and from the year 2017 rbi has uh, has actually uh, done a wonderful job and a lot of other jurisdictions are taking precedence from it so in 2017 rbi mandated lai for otc derivatives market firstly and then in 2018 they have further extended it to the non derivative market the money market ird also joined uh, this initiative and they have also mandated lei for for the insurers who are doing transactions above 50 crores sebi in 2018 mentioned about lei in in the kyc uh, they were given its recommendation for the efes in commodity derivative markets but they haven't mandated it they have only recommended that lei can be taken as one of the identifier in 2021 and afterwards rbi has done something which no other jurisdiction has done so rbi has included lei in the payment system so uh, currently rbi has mandated lei in the cross border transactions so all the ad category 1 bank has to mandatorily take an lei from the corporate if a transaction is more than 50 crores similarly if any transaction happening in the domestic market rbi has included lei in the messaging structure of rtgs and any after so the messaging structure of any after rtgs lei of beneficiary and originator has to be there if a transaction goes beyond 50 crores rbi has also extended this mandate for borrowers so can you believe it that by 2025 all the corporate entities having a group level corporate exposure of more than 5 cr has to mandatorily take lei and report so this is the extent to which rbi has gone and this is definitely going to bring a lot of lei's in the system coming specifically to the securities market so 2023 has been a very good year for us and as you have as already mentioned that there has been no direct mandate till yet from sebi but in 2023 sebi has amended the fpi regulation and while reviewing the fpi regulation they have mandated lei in the kyc documentation of the foreign portfolio investors earlier it was part of the kyc document but it was considered as an optional field but in the recent circular issued by sebi sebi has mandated it for all fresh fpi registrations and also for all existing fpis they have also asked that to ensure that lei is always active because lei is not just a number which is which will always you know uh, uh, be same it has to be renewed every year it has to be active because data gets obsolete gets redundant also in may 2023 sebi mandated lei supporting the earlier mandate by rbi which is for borrowers they have also extended it for the issuers of listed or proposed to list non convertible securities securities debt instruments and security receipts and they have also instructed depositories to map the lei to the existing isns there are around 280 regulations around the globe and if you can see this the the uh, the picture here there are many regulation which has come from india and as i said that indian uh, uh, the regulations which has come from india law of jurisdiction has taken precedence from that and this is the reason if you look at the global lei numbers 6% of the lei population comes from india alone <clears throat> talking about what next we can expect and what recently has happened so many of you from the maybe uh, from the banking industry knows about iso 2022 which is a new messaging standard which will come into force from i think 2025 the transition process start from 2025 till 2027 so if you if you would, many of you would have referred to that document recently uh, the bis cpmi has concluded a recommendation a consultation and they have submitted a report to g20 wherein they have considered lei as a equal identifier to big code and they have also emphasized that they have mentioned that that the address information can also be transferred from the lei database supporting that recommendation consultation uh, recommendation folksberg group also updated the transparency standards and recently the november report uh, the swift pmpg has also endorsed it and they have said that lei can be used for better account validation fart of recommendation 16 is this something which we are eyeing on because they also talk about wire transfers across the across the globe or 
cross border or domestic so probably uh, they are also planning to review fat of recommendation 16 because that talks about beneficiary and originator uh, uh, details in the wire transfers now definitely one aspect to lei is definitely the mandates which are coming across the globe and this is definitely one way to look at it but at the same time i believe that financial institutions and private sector also has the equal responsibility to explore as to how lei can be used in the existing processes so this is a screenshot of the recent uh, g20 uh, paper Uh, which talks about you know a recommendation to the glyph and the roc where they asked us to engage with private sector as to explore as to how lei can be used in kyc fraud vendor scam detection enhanced corporate invoice reconciliation better account to account validation and efficient screening so maybe these all areas can be looked at by all of you and because there are chances if you use lei directly and use our api there are chances that you can provide faster kyc to your end clients and a lot of cost can be saved coming to the end because i don't have much of time i think i need to conclude and the last presentation is about the validation agent framework because as i spoke about the entire ecosystem i think financial institution can also support the lei initiative which is a global initiative by joining and collaborating directly with any of the local operating unit it could be any lei issuer it could be lei l in india it could be bloomberg it could be anyone and facilitate direct issuance of lei to your end client rather than advising them to go to some lou to get the lei so this is something which you can always look at and feel free to reach out to me offline for any questions thank you very much thank you vikas we will now have um shiram from the nsc come up to do his introduction thank you my name is shriram krishnan i am the chief business development officer of nsc very happy to be here in this fix event thank you for giving us the opportunity and i look forward to the deliberations i also take this opportunity to welcome all of you thank you thank you sir i'd also like to do the introductions first to mir from the bsc if you have anything to say Okay. Um we're just waiting now so just give us one minute. We're waiting for David to set his presentation up for uh market trends at the moment. So give us one second. Get this ready. Sorry, give us about one minute. So I'll just give an introduction of who David is. So David Rabamowitz is the head of global index analysts analytics in Asia, um, you know, for Pacific market structure, and he's going to be doing a presentation on the current trends and volume turnover that we see coming from different areas within the Asian market. So hopefully, I think he can hear us. Yeah. Let's see. Thank you. 
Yeah. Exactly. Okay, given that uh, we have a few minutes before David logs in, uh, maybe I'll take this opportunity to just sort of speak a bit about NSC, what's happening in the market, and also, you know, give you some uh, flavor of what you can expect in the weeks, months ahead. Well, as you know, NSC is today the largest derivatives exchange in the whole world and has been so for the last four years on the trot. This is as per the data from the World Federation of Exchanges. And over the past many months, I should say in particular, ever since the COVID pandemic began, to be very precise, we've seen a huge surge in retail participation. Almost every month, about two and a half to three million DMAT accounts are being opened. And the trend seems to suggest that we will very well add about two to sorry 20 to 30 million accounts in a year if this is the rate of growth retail participation overall is about uh, roughly 35 percent but if the current trend continues then this could very well go to very big two digit numbers so that's one trend that we are witnessing of late and which we are obviously concerned about mainly because of the fact that a lot of the retail customers seem to be trading in options. And so at every available platform, we are making it very, very clear that retail investors should be what they should be, which is investors and not get into options trading because that's a space for professional investors and not really for retail individuals to dabble with, right? And as an exchange, we don't believe derivatives are for the common man. So this is something that we are working aggressively to make known to everybody far and wide across the country. We do about five to 7,000 programs every year for building investor awareness, for deepening investor education. And this is also the main theme or message that we are sharing with investors at every possible opportunity. So if I have to speak of one big theme or trend that we are witnessing here at NSC, this is it. And this is broadly what we believe, uh, you know, we should be sharing with all of you as well today, as uh, some of us are also investors in the market. When we say we expect retailers to be investors, what we mean is that we, we expect them to stay put for the long run. So investors typically invest today and wait for the next three, four, five years, and then try to you know, evaluate how their investments are doing and take longer term oriented calls by and large and not trading calls as in buy to buy now and sell in one hour. That's not what we expect investors to do. So this is a very, very important message for us at this point in time. The second trend that we are witnessing is the advent of technology-based traders <clears throat> high frequency traders, proprietary traders, and so on. Now, we've always had algorithmic uh, trading permitted for institutional clients. And now there's a big demand from retail customers as well, who come via the platform providers. And retail customers want to be able to access the markets through APIs and their own um, algorithms, right? This is something that is being reviewed by the capital markets regulator. As today, there are plenty of sources from where the retail customer can obtain an API. How safe are these providers? And how safe is it for the retail customer to rely on such APIs for, for their uh, transactions? Again, the philosophy behind the usage of APIs by retail customers is something that we need to keep in mind as well. If somebody says, you know, I want to exit all my stocks or the entire portfolio once it reaches a certain value. So I want an API to track the value of my portfolio. And when that desired value is reached overall, I just want to exit all my stocks. Well, 
that can still be justified provided you know you have been holding these stocks for a reasonable length of time and it's a it's a longer term strategy and not a short term oriented trading strategy right uh, but there are also other retailers who want to have apis to do intraday trading and speculation which is not something we want to we want to promote uh, neither does uh, the capital markets regulator want to promote so i think we have to make sure that the retail investors are protected to an extent possible and they are aware of the risks and the downside in particular before they get into any such apis and uh, algorithm al- algorithmic trading and so on so so that's the second uh, trend or theme or demand that we see uh, from the market the advent of uh, technology based uh, traders also means that we are seeing a, a rise in the number of high frequency traders as we call them and proprietary traders these are institutional traders but we have seen far too many of them coming to the market and you know every one of them tends to pump in um, millions of transactions every day and if you look at nse overall we we receive on some days about 20 22 billion messages order messages and if you look at the actual number of confirmed trades on many days we settle more than uh, 220 million trades so these are not small numbers by any stretch of imagination and as you can imagine these can become 2x 3x 4x in no time uh, given the number of newer investors who want to access the india markets whether as foreign portfolio investors or as retail customers uh, like i was how i was mentioning a short while back so the advent of technology based trading and the potential impact this trend can have is another uh, burning topic for all of us the third aspect that uh, we are seized about is you know the the need for india uh, to to consider an extension of trading hours particularly given that global news flow is not restricted to the trading times which are currently 9:15 am to 3:30 pm there are global events that take place even after the markets are closed in india like for example a silicon valley bank need not necessarily collapse necessarily collapse between uh, the trading window in india and it it normally does uh, you know the news does come out when the us opens uh, which means uh, it's around 5:30 6 pm india time and therefore at this point in time there is no mechanism for the investors in india the retail investors in india for example to hedge their portfolio risk if such news emanates when us opens it is for this reason that we held a consultative uh, process with various stakeholders for over 9 months and after the 9 month consultation process based on the majority view that emerged in these consultations we have submitted a proposal to sebi seeking to introduce a window a trading window between 6 pm and 9 pm india time uh, mainly for equity derivatives and index derivatives uh, to be very very specific and we believe that this is a small opportunity or a small beginning with which the retail investor potentially gets an opportunity to hedge the portfolio risk should there be any significant news flow coming out when the us opens for instance of course you can you can ask me if news flow is limited to 6 pm to 9 pm uh, india time certainly not ideally it should be a longer 20 22 23 kind our kind of a window if uh, if that's really the end state yes possibly we need to get there but you know we aren't there at this point in time and we need to make a small beginning somewhere if at all we have any ambitions of of extending this further if you look at the other uh, exchanges of the world most of them provide this kind of a trading window uh, for around 21 22 hours and therefore although india was the first country in the whole world to introduce automated screen based trading uh, it is it is you know it's funny that the other exchanges have overtaken us in this uh, in this respect and they have an off uh, they have a bigger trading window than what we have incidentally for commodities in india we have a trading window all the way up to midnight and uh, there we don't see any problem in uh, in participating in these extended hours so so it's something that you know we need to be mindful of 
and and that's a burning topic again there have been a lot of discussions uh, both in uh, the regulatory you know uh, space as well as in many panels and and events and conferences so that's an important topic for us and the last uh, uh, trend or theme or discussion topic that uh, we invariably bump into is around the new products and uh, what to expect kind of uh, stuff as far as india is concerned right at at nsc we recently you know launched the whole range of commodity contracts on our platform after getting approvals from the regulators for for the same and and so we we believe that we will be able to offer all the asset classes under one roof given this development uh, which is a which is a uh, a lot of ease for for investors when it comes to the operational process given that many many apis have been trading equities and equity derivatives on um, nse for a long time also there is interoperability between uh, clearing corporations as far as equities and equity derivatives are concerned uh, and uh, you know the similar interoperability framework uh, for commodities although was proposed initially it didn't uh, get accepted at that point in time uh, of course it can be worked out at some other uh, point in time going forward and finally in terms of market developments uh, the sebi chairperson has spoken about uh, you know introducing asba based transactions for the secondary market asba stands for applications supported by blocked amounts in other words when a retail customer applies or wants to do a transaction in the secondary market suppose i want to buy some shares of a company today what happens is that the money moves from my account my bank account to the broker who is used for the transaction and it is the broker who does the clearing and settlement with the clearing corporation of the exchange where i have done the transaction and this is as far as the retail customers are concerned and therefore the funds actually go through the broker to the clearing corporation likewise if i sell as a retail customer then the securities tend to go through the broker uh, to the clearing corporation this is the current framework and as you can imagine there have been some accidents in the past both with funds and securities uh, and to prevent any such misuse or abuse the regulators have uh, sought to put in place a mechanism where just like the primary market applications for example when you apply in an ipo in india you can choose asba where the money stands blocked in your bank account and gets released only when the actual allotment happens in the same way even for secondary market transactions asba is going to be possible from the 1st of january 2024 so that's a very immediate priority although it is not mandatory it is going to be introduced on an optional basis beginning 1st jan 2024 the sebi chairperson has also spoken about uh, spoken about two other things one is the t0 settlement the same day settlement cycle introduction and uh, this is something um, for which some discussions are on a consultative paper is going to be issued by the capital markets regulator and the consultative process will then throw up the way forward and therefore please look out uh, and you know go through the consultative paper when it's issued by sebi and that will then form the basis for any discussions inputs and decisions thereafter the sebi chairperson has also spoken about an instantaneous settlement framework for uh, retail customers largely uh, of course this uh, she indicated that is something which will happen by the end of 2024 again preliminary discussions on this topic uh, but more interestingly there are also some uh, safety measures that are being introduced by the capital markets regulator for example the irra investor re risk reduction access mechanism has just gone live a few days back uh, so if i am a retail investor using a broker and there is a technical glitch on the broker's app or uh, you know web based portal then i can go to the irra mechanism and square off my positions and and save myself from any unnecessary difficulties later so this is again a measure that's been rolled out earlier uh, a few a few months back we went live with uh, you know the upstreaming and downstreaming of client funds this is an this is a measure measure that was rolled out to make sure that funds of the retail customers are safe and uh, they don't stay in the broker's account at all so by end of day brokers are required to send them across to the clearing corporation so as you can see uh, while there are a number of changes and also keep in mind the t plus 1 settlement cycle went live last year 
and um, you know there was a lot of planning and preparation for t plus 1 rollout and and it's gone through very very seamlessly so while there are lots of changes happening it's it's worthwhile to note that consultative processes are being followed white papers are being issued discussions take place and everything happens in an orderly fashion much much uh, uh, to the to the delight of the entire ecosystem so that's in a nutshell what is going on this is to just give a backdrop and context to today's discussions i will stop here and uh, hopefully david uh, can join us now thank you okay guys as the fact that uh, dave is just having still a few technical difficulties we're going to jump straight into the panel so could i just uh, have Mr. Krishnan again to come back onto the stage and Mr. Patel to come as well. Thank you. Can we get the copy of sets? Can we just also do a radio check that Dave and um, so Mr. Williams can also hear us? Can you just jump in now? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, sir, we can. Is that you, Dave? Thank you. That's Simon, actually. Oh, Simon. Hey, Simon. We can get you guys on video as well. Is that possible? Oh, there we are. <laughs> nice. Okay. And is Dave still around or? It's nothing. Let's give it about one minute. We're going to set test up. Can you hear me? Hello. Yeah, Dave, we can hear you a little bit. Can you hear us? Can you hear me? Yep. Can you hear us? Yes. Okay, cool. I guess we're just going to go to start. Guys, I just want to say thank you again for all coming for this panel. I'm actually very, very excited to have this. This is something that we've been wanting to do for the past two years. Um, now we have you know, the head of the NSC, head of BSC. We've got Simon Williams that is a forefront when it comes to participating in India trading. And of course, Dave, as one of the heads of the leading brokerages here, this is something that's really exciting for all of us. So look, I, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of answers and there's a lot of um, points that you pointed out there just coming from this introduction. So I want to just go straight into this one. And Simon, I, this is the first question I want to give you. So off the top of your head, like what is regarding most of these upcoming market structure developments in India? What's on your mind? Like what are cause of concerns? What were excitements? Like just kind of give us like an overview of what you are feeling as a participant in trading the Indian market at the moment. Sure. Um, well, first of all, um, let me, please. Um... I'd like to thank you for inviting me to the panel uh, today. It's uh, it's a real honor to be uh, involved. Uh, my sincere apologies for not being there in person. I hope to to uh, get to uh, um, to Mumbai again um, early next year um, to carry on face to face discussions. But uh, thank you very much for having me on um, today. Um, look, I, I think probably before answering the question, may, maybe um, if I can kind of go back a, a step and just in terms of what uh, we've been focused on in India, and that I think can then shape why what uh, we're focused on at the moment um, as a as a as a group. So, um, you know, sure, kind of highlight a you know a lot of. Um, you know, really big initiatives. Uh, T plus one um, obviously was uh, was the major one that really kind of woke everybody up um, to to be involved, uh, and it became very apparent that it was uh, important to be um, very hands on um, and be uh, present and active in those discussions to ensure uh, that uh, we got as uh, uh, you know, uh, as good an outcome as we possibly could with uh, with respect to uh, to T plus one. Um, look, and you know, and I think uh, on the whole that uh, experience, uh, you know, for the entire in industry, uh, you know, really demonstrated, you know, what really quite constructive and great things are possible when all segments of the ecosystem uh, together. And I know that really kind of fits in well with the concept of fixed uh, community, but I don't think we would have got, um, you know, a, a result that we currently have uh, for T plus one without the FPIs, the domestic players, mutual funds, brokers, custodians, and exchanges all working together in a trusted, constructive manner in order to kind of deal with, um, you know, a lot of the many issues that came across uh, the way. Um, yes, and, you know, and look, 
issues, created opportunities. It's built some very good relationships, uh, I think, for the for the for the future, um, and you know, it shapes what I think is possible uh, in the years ahead as we we look to kind of contribute and develop um, and enhance the uh, the Indian market ecosystem. Um, so thinking back, what what were things that I think uh, that made uh, T plus one as successful as it as it was. Uh, well, first of all, there was kind of clear direction, I think, and aspiration. There was, you know, there was no shortage of aspirations of getting to T plus one, uh, and and that was very clear, and it was became very clear to the industry that it was important to get on on board for that. Um, I think as a result, uh, the the industry, um, you know, came up with a series of red lines. Um, that um, you know made it possible to kind of work towards and discuss and to negotiate. So, for example, the the, the FBIs um, you know wanted for the clear benefit of the market, uh, not to, for the India to become uh, pre funding. Uh, it didn't want India. Uh, you know, we didn't want uh, I suppose to to have to execute our FX transactions at a, a non recognised uh, period of the day. And I think very importantly for the and you know framing for a lot of the other discussions we're going to have today is that no one real no one wanted the level of failed trades or hand delivery tra trades to increase uh, from a T plus two environment in the T plus one environment. Um, so that was really important, and I think set up some really good um, you know uh, parameters for us all to um, to work uh, work on. Um, I, you know, and and I mean, as a result of of that, I mean, in terms of my any of my kind of interaction and, and certainly conversations I have with anybody who is 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 thinking about being involved in trying to shape uh, and and develop uh, the Indian market future, future, I always kind of bring that in mind and and the the constructive manner that all parties worked in. So, I've highlighted oh. a good experience. Um, but in terms of things that you know, I think uh, you know we're, we're looking to kind of really focus on at the moment. Um, you know, there's a core um, aspiration to kind of, you know, what what can we do to reduce the um, the cost of doing business and and the frictions uh, in in the market. Um, you know, what what is it that um, we can learn from other jurisdictions that we can apply uh, in in the Indian market. Um, and you know how do we manage the risk of those changes and 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 make it uh, you know work well? I think um, you know uh, more recently there's been a lot of um, issues uh, and burden around account opening and maintenance, um, and that is an area that uh, certainly has got a lot of airtime. Uh, I think in in the industry groups and you know is 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 definitely uh, at a stage where you know, people can consult, get together and work out the the right results for the future. Um, I think, um, you know, as we're looking to kind of reduce costs and, and maximize efficiency, you know, the, the, the whole concept of kind of repatriating uh, proceeds and trade netting, um, I think many will know that for FBIs, there is a, obviously the, the tax withholding process, which reduces any ability to net proceeds at the moment, which uh, creates inefficiencies and talk about that later in context of other uh, questions um, and you know and especially as we're thinking about moving to t plus one that will be absolutely essential um, and then you know from a trading considering uh, perspective I mean FPIs and you know and myself included are always talking around kind of you know how do we efficiently do block crossing you know how do what are the guardrails uh, we have in all markets including India uh, sufficient for an so the circuit breakers um, and you know and in the case of you know a market which does have a very very large uh, index proportion as well uh, closing auction so those are the things that we're mainly focused on Love it, absolutely love it. Look, I think we're going to jump straight into this a little bit more and get into the details, right? But you know, the, the first thing that you brought up was T plus one, right? And I kind of just want to go back to both of the exchanges here and just ask, like, what were the challenges that you guys faced? Like, what were the benefits and challenges of transitioning into T plus one? Samir, if you'd like to start, oh, you'll take okay. up to you, both of you. Any of you want to start and just kind of give us a discussion of like when you know, say we announced that you know this discussion of transitioning into T plus one. How was it for you? Well, how did you handle it? So, well, the initial announcement obviously, you know, led to a bit of uh, discussion in the marketplace because the initial announcement suggested that exchanges had the freedom to choose which stocks to put out on T plus one basis. And then when it was highlighted, 
they took they took immediate measures to you know get all the market infrastructure institutions together mm -hmm. to make sure that there is an orderly mechanism which is made public in terms of how these stocks are going to move to T plus one across the exchanges. Mm -hmm. And when this was published at, by the market infrastructure institutions, it became very clear to all the stakeholders that this was not going to be rushed through. On the contrary, it was going to be a, a few stocks every year, sorry, every month, mm -hmm. 500 stocks to be very precise. And therefore it was a very orderly movement of 500 stocks each month to the T plus one settlement cycle framework beginning with the bottom stocks in terms of market capitalization. So what it did to the entire market and the stakeholders was that it gave everybody a chance to test this process out. And the market, the market infrastructure institutions also got a chance to make a gradual shift. And therefore, towards the end of this entire one year long transition, when we reached the top 500 stocks, we knew exactly what was needed to make it a success. And the foreign investors also had already tasted the process because some of the stocks that they hold had already gone on to T plus one a couple of months before the final 500 went live. So I think the, the best uh, you know, way to implement something like this is to do it in an orderly fashion, in a piecemeal way, rather than approaching it in a big bang, uh, in a big bang way. That's a big learning for all of us. In fact, that was the apprehension in the initial stages, but I think the, the first introduction of T plus one was the perfect recipe to succeed in that situation. Apart from that, obviously everybody had to carry out changes on their systems and processes uh, because we were talking about stocks being available on T plus one basis in parallel to stocks, other stocks which were going to be on T plus two basis. So this meant that we had to run two settlement cycles, uh, in parallel, which is quite a quite a humongous task, any which way you look at it, for the clearing corporation. And added to that, the fact that there is interoperability in India between clearing corporations, it makes it very complicated. But I think all of the market infrastructure institutions, as well as the regulators, and of course the investors, and the, uh, the brokers and custodians, like Simon mentioned, everybody came together and help each other to make this a, a roaring success. Thank you for that. Yeah, thanks, uh, Simon, and thank you for having us here today for uh, this uh, session. In fact, uh, Shriram spoke about the existing uh, T plus one, uh, 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 how it terminated into a T plus one, and how I'm looking forward for the T plus zero, so on and so forth. But uh, in 2001, I could I can uh, remember that the SEBI had introduced the rolling settlement cycle and how the entire industry at the stock uh, exchanges have trans transformed itself from and transmitted itself because there was huge de uh, defaults, uh, delivery defaults, so on and so forth from a, uh, t a rolling uh, settlement process from a cycle from uh, in 2001 to uh, T plus five, 2002 introduced, uh, and then T, T plus three, and eventually seeing the day of light of uh, 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 T plus one, it's, it's been a very, very long way. And the way it has been implemented, it is in a very, very structured way, starting with few stocks and eventually ending up uh, on a, on a, uh, on a uh, continuous basis, on a T plus one basis. So it's, it's a long way uh, India has progressed, the stock exchanges in India has progressed uh, uh, throughout this last 20, 23 years of uh, existence. Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay, look, so I just wanted to reach out to Dave. So this is kind of just like a build up to what our main question is going to be. So Dave, do you want to just give us a little bit of insight on, you know, on the brokerage side of how this implementation was dealt with on your side? How easy was it? Were there concerns? And then, you know, well, what are things that you think that could have been done better handled by both your firm or as well from, you know, the exchanges and, you know, Sebi kind of talking about this? Hi, thank you very much for your time, everybody. It's really much appreciated. Apologies for the technical issues earlier. Um, yeah, I, I guess from a brokerage perspective and the international side, um, shortening settlement cycles does create a little bit of pressure from our perspective in terms of ensuring uh, ensuring settlement uh, processes are, are, are undertaken uh, in a timely manner. Uh, you know, we've had precedents that's been set in other markets, China Connect program being one of them, where a T0, T plus zero and a one and a half day 
is potentially a tough time in terms of delivering um, and 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 seeking finality of settlement in 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 a true manner. So you have to kind of draw a distinction between market side and client side. And what's happened in China, as an example, is the brokerage community has had to step in to fund the trade to ensure that we settle with the market and or with the client in a timely manner. And so there's always these concerns that it raises the transactional costs, the implicit costs for the brokerage community in terms of uh, being able to settle uh, stock and cash in a timely manner. But uh, as Simon was mentioning, these are measures that we've been working on uh, with the uh, Indian authorities. Um, I guess if you look at global markets, there is a continued shift across global markets to move to a tighter settlement regime. So there's a behavioral approach that needs to be undertaken. There's a lot of work that needs to be undertaken with the partnership with the custodial side of the trade to ensure that all mechanisms are in place in a timely manner to, to, to settle. So I guess whilst it puts pressure on the market, these are we need to break ground in terms of being able to to, to, to move forward. And, and you could argue that when we look back, we'll look back at at, at India as a sort of uh, as, as a sort of uh, bellwether of, of of breaking that ground to get us to a to a settlement cycle that we know is possible if we look at markets such as China. Ideally, we'd like to get to a situation where the brokerage community is not necessarily needing to step in to fund a trade to ensure settlement in a timely manner, that the processes are involved that allow for direct settlement where the brokerage community doesn't have to step into the middle of that transaction. But yeah, as I say, um, um, stepping stones with, uh, w w w with some degree of, 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 a, of a steep learning curve at the beginning, but hopefully eventually um, uh, you will, you, India will lead the way for global markets. Yeah. Agree with you there. And so look, Simon, this kind of comes into this next question. You know, I'm going to bring this first back to the exchanges before throwing it to you, Simon. So look, now we see the idea of India pushing into T plus zero. And we're looking into see this is going to be for 2024 in the early to mid 2024. You know, can you guys give us an update on this change and how it might impact the exchanges and how you guys will be able to process this? Well, like I mentioned earlier, a short while earlier, uh, there is going to be a consultative paper that's going to be issued by the capital markets regulator. And obviously everybody will have a, an opportunity to submit their viewpoints, which will all be taken into account before any T plus zero framework is actually announced by the regulator. That's what we've been told in discussions. And T, T zero, if it, is it technically possible to achieve? I mean, the answer is yes, technologically, we, we can deliver even instantaneous settlements. That's not, that's not a big deal. The, the challenge for us is to make sure that all stakeholders uh, who are allowed to participate in this, in this segment, if I, can, if I can call it so, are able to participate in a meaningful way. Right? So that's, I think, the lookout of uh, the regulators as well. And they have also assured us that this is going to be implemented after taking into account all the pros and cons and it's not going to be rushed through, nor is it going to be undertaken if there is going to be any significant impact on the liquidity or uh, the order book per se. Obviously, nobody wants fragmentation of the existing order book or any unfair advantage to any particular segment of the stakeholder community. So I think uh, overall, you know, this is going to be another based uh, discussion based approach from the capital markets regulators. And therefore, we need to be looking out for the white paper as and when it's issued. Just to that one as well. Do you think that there's going to be a possibility that when Semi announces this kind of structure, that it might actually just be focused solely to retail to start this off? Or was this something that, you know, foreign institutions and domestic institutions will come in at the same time or something maybe gradually later? No, so there are many questions to obviously get into here. Like, for example, if foreign investors are allowed to participate in this space, how will they take care of the funding arrangements because uh, of the geographical time zones? Uh, because the trading time gets over by 3.30 p.m., for example, exactly. which is already you know, time to go home for people who are ahead of India on time zone. Right. And therefore, these things need to be worked out. Obviously, for T plus one, we were able to manage with the 7 a.m. confirmation deadline. Mm -hmm. 
on the morning of t plus one. That's how it worked eventually. That was the major major reason for uh, t plus one becoming possible for the foreign investors in particular. So we'll need to look at some of these aspects in uh, greater detail. And that's why I think the consultation paper is a good idea as a starting point. And who knows, it may not be open to all the stakeholders to participate in. Maybe it will be restricted only to the retail customers. We don't know what the eventual framework is going to be, but uh, we need to look out for the consultation paper. Okay. Uh, it, it is definitely, uh, uh, it will be very interesting to look how it will evolve. In fact, uh, we are looking at a universe of more than 1400 members, more than 140 investors in India, the foreign participants, institutions, so on and so forth. So the uh, how it's going to evolve is going to be very interesting. Second, the challenge would be if a trade, uh, the trading session ends on a day, how will the custodians react, the settlement react, and you should have enough time to do that. So uh, it, it has been, uh, there's a transformation from T plus five, T plus three, T plus one, and T plus zero will definitely happen, but it will have to wait and watch how does it evolve, whether, whether it will be in a structured way or uh, we will have to wait and see how it will. Simon, this is gonna come back to you on this one. So question that I have for you, just kind of like backtracking all the way for this, T plus zero settlement. Do you think it's possible that the international, you know, international institutions can adopt or take on such a challenge, right? I mean, like what are some solutions or something that you would request for help maybe from the exchanges or from the brokers to be able to go into this transition if potentially you go into T plus zero? Yeah, sure. Um, look, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a much more, uh, it's a far different proposition to talk about T plus uh, zero uh, than T plus one. Um, and that's for sure. Um, you know, you, you're talking about some some fundamental changes to the way in which uh, you know the, the ability to move fund, funds around the world uh, in in when when other markets are not on T zero uh, as well is is definitely a challenge. Um, it's just about cope, you can just about cope with it in a T plus one environment. Although uh, it is very important to recognise, as, as David was highlighting, that you know we, we already have quite a lot of inherent risk that has we've had to accept um, as part of the ecosystem to move to T plus one. Um, the OTR deadline, for example, at seven thirty is um, you know is 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 quite significant. It's quite a bit significant earlier than than it was when in the T plus two environment, and um, you know uh, we'd need to worry about that. Obviously, you don't even have that um, in a in a T plus zero environment. I'm not even sure what that kind of looks like. Um, but effectively, it would mean um, that the market becomes ordinarily uh, pre-funding, um, which is, if you remember from the, the the red line outlines that I had for that we presented for the T plus one, was an was a direction that um, the international community in particular didn't want to go to. Um, it was going to be difficult for, for that and, and create uh, a lot of challenges, especially around kind of rebalances uh, and, and major rebalances, as we see in India, as India is, you know, much higher weighting of, uh, of many indices than it, than it has been in the past. So um, I suppose the big ask will be around some flexibility. Uh, around settlements um, cycle, um, you know, uh, in 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 China, for example, which is a T plus zero market uh, currently, um, you know, one of the conditions really for MSCI inclusion was to, uh, and, and you know, uh, well, conditions and and actually proponents for kind of getting um, inclusion over the line was really that having the ability for investors to select. T plus one or T plus two settlement on their buys to allow them time to arrange the sufficient funding um, to, uh, to enter and, and settle their trades in the market. You know, David has highlighted the inefficiencies that's caused because brokers have had to fund that, which is never ideal and, and adds to the additional cost uh, for the market. But it's gonna take a while, I think, for the entire um, international community to be able to trade in, in India, fund in India and settle in India for T plus zero when they may need to kind of raise funds uh, in the US um, and effectively settle trades before they've even been traded uh, in the US. Um, that's going to be a real challenge. So I think flexibility and settlement cycles for international community is going to be absolutely critical um, in, in, in making that happen. Appreciate that. Um, look, so, you know, just pre kind of based, pressed off time here, 
I'm going to just kind of skip out of the extended trading hours and I'm going to kind of jump into something of more like the rate of change for India when it comes to market structure. So this is a question back to both exchanges. Um, look, as India starts to take the stage for the leading emerging market with you know increasing volume turnover, what are the ideas and concerns that you would have as, as it exchanges, like, you know, to keep a pace of such a rate of change. Will we expect this to, uh, rate of change to increase? Do you expect market structure to keep continuously going as it is? India is a developing country and in any developing country, you have to expect a number of changes to constantly take place because we are work in progress uh, to put it in a very mild way. So I don't think the number of changes will, will sort of slow down. It's very difficult to expect that to happen. And whatever is being done is being done for either the benefit of the investors or the intermediaries in India or the issuers. At the end of the day, I think India is what it is today because of the quality of the companies that are listed on the stock exchanges. And the quality of the companies is ensured by a high quality corporate governance framework that's been stipulated by the regulators. So, if you ask the issuers, they will, they will have a complaint about so many disclosures, disclosures to make within 30 minutes of the board meeting time, so many filings to make and so on. But that's what makes these companies look so good for investors to pick and trade. Likewise, you know, the, the intermediaries have had to go through a number of changes and, and stipulations, uh, but I think it's for the greater good and many of the Many of the stakeholders today appreciate that what's been achieved in the last few years, for example, is making India look much better than what it was. The safety and the efficiency have gone up significantly. And so I think that's the big picture that we need to, we need to look at and be happy about what we've achieved as a collective ecosystem. Change is in inevitable, isn't it? And what we have seen over a period of time, uh, nobody imagined 2020, 2020, Everybody would sit at home and start trading uh, in the, from their laptops and their iPads and their desks. Uh, that was a change. And technology has been a key enabler, isn't it? Uh, we've seen the markets grow. In fact, when we uh, everybody was at home, everybody thought that the stock markets, uh, whether the stock markets will be on, running, so on and so forth, whether there will be settlements, yes or no. There were a lot many questions, but eventually... When the uh, markets uh, opened during the COVID and we saw a lot of investors, I can give, uh, put forward some numbers. In fact, pre-COVID, the number of investors in the capital markets were around 50 million. And uh, in, uh, by and today, in fact, we have 140 million investors. So this is, this is what has happened to the stock markets. The number of investors has grown. Now, what is the reason for it? basically technology and technology has played a key enabler. We have seen all, all uh, uh, technology enabled brokers or we, uh, in the uh, today's terminology, we call them the discount brokers has helped the cause though. But nevertheless, uh, I would also like to add one point to what Sh uh, Shriram has said about uh, corporate governance is uh, very important. Today, what we have also witnessed as a stock exchanges Many corporates have started having their board meetings and they announce their results only after 3.30 when the market is closed so that it does not have any impact on the price of the stock. So that is also itself in itself is in a, a, a right way towards corporate governance. So there's no quote unquote uh, any uh, finger pointed out towards the management or the uh, so that even that care is taken about. Okay, I'm going to go mm -hmm. with Dave. So Dave, can we just give a question here? So what is the impact it's had you know, based on the market participants, like for you, how are you guys handling to keep pace as a broker? Well, I guess um, there's a lot to unpack from that question, I guess, uh, in terms of change at pace in India. Let's see if I can actually share a slide here. I guess we'll just it's focus on like trading as it is. Oh yeah, if you want to throw it in your presentation. Perfect, there you go. You see that? Yeah, yeah, we see it. Okay, so I guess, you know, we start back from, from the demographic shifts in the world. It's a great chart from Parab Khanna in terms of, you know, where we are from a population shift. And, and, and I guess that's having a profound impact on the shift, the seismic shift in terms of, as Simon was suggesting, uh, you know, emerging market weight and emerging market contribution. And that's what's playing out in, 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 in the market in India. Because uh, when you look 
at the demographic shift in 2023 will be seen as somewhat of an inflection point in terms of total population size where India will overtake China. You can get a sense of how that will play out in terms of emerging market benchmark shifts. Uh, the table at the bottom is hot off the press with respect to the upcoming MSCI rebalance in November. And we're acutely aware of watching how India's status within the emerging market landscape is shifting and growing uh, in the sense that even in this November rebalance, India will gain 55 basis points over China. And when you look at the chart on the top right here, you can see the impact that it has in terms of the overall footprint. If we go back two decades, China and India had a very similar weighting within the overall emerging market landscape at around eight to eight and a half percent. But you roll forward two decades, and we know the story in terms of regulatory reform measures in China, and you see that delta growing to around a 35% weight differential between China and India back in 2020. But since the unraveling in China as a result of common prosperity and uh, OFAC sanctions, executive orders, et cetera, concurrently you had uh, you know, the Ministry of Finance and SEBI helping the cause by raising the foreign ownership uh, limits. And gradually you start to see this real shift whereby India's weight in EM has almost doubled now from 8% to 15 and a half. And actually in November, it will be the first time ever that India will pass through the 16% threshold as a percentage weight within EM. So these shifts, and so that delta between China and India is contracted significantly. And we're watching this very closely because it has a profound impact in terms of investor compositions of benchmarks, investor uh, exposures. Um, and then when we talk in terms of benchmarking and both active and passive exposures, we look at matters pertaining to accessibility and replicability and investability, all these fancy words. But at the end of the day, when it comes to talking in APAC and in emerging market terms, it's really about market access. And as we work together, regulatory authorities, exchanges, market participants, to ensure that we provide a mechanism by which it becomes efficient to transact in a market. And that has a number of key measures. It becomes a more worthwhile and interesting market from the perspective of the entire uh, liquidity spectrum, from your long only asset management community, your content systematic low latency community, your retail participants, your domestic institutional investors, et cetera. So we look at this from the holistic perspective of growing the market from, the, from a perspective of market access and market efficiency. And so all these measures come to play to help us uh, drive forward to, to effectively facilitate in, in growing these, um, these markets in terms of access and exposure. Yeah. Simon, you want to jump in on this one as well? Yeah, I mean, sure. I mean, I, I, I mean, I don't have uh, a, a, a too much to, to kind of um, add. I mean, I, I think, you know, maybe you kind of bring it back to the experience of the rate of change. I mean, I mean, obviously, um, you know, I, I, like I alluded earlier to the the huge amount of aspirations to kind of change things um, uh, and the like, and 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 I suppose one of the things that look it, it look backwards is, you know, are we giving enough? time to the market to kind of really work out and consult to kind of create these changes. Um, you know, we, we, you know, the, the constructive manner uh, that we were able to kind of, um, you know, negotiate a phased approach, uh, uh, approach to T plus one really, really helped by the industry, industry time to kind of solve a lot of these really critical issues. And, and like I said, got to a very, very good, good outcome. Um, but it's important to kind of look at uh, some of these changes that we've, you know, that we that have been developed in, you know, T plus one and, and the inherent risks that are still there. Uh, and what is it that we can do to in, improve uh, a lot of uh, those changes? Um, I, you know, it's great that we haven't had many um, bad experiences, I think, in, in the T plus one environment in terms of mass level of fails and things like that. But uh, it is possible because it's all down to technology um, and, uh, and you know, lots of different parties uh, from brokers to fund managers to custodians where something has to fail and it could go wrong. 
do we have the right, have we spent enough uh, time just making sure that we're fixing all those uh, parts of the ecosystem to ensure that um, we're keeping things as safe as possible. So I, I, I do like the fact that there's good aspirations and a re-race forward and, and working with the whole community in India to try and get some really good solutions. But we just need to make sure that we uh, take a look back and just make sure we've got the right uh, safety measures in place and that it's growing appropriately to, um, to the size of the market it has now become. You know, I just totally agree with you on that one. There's a kind of a point that I wanted to express here was just, you know, like you said, you know, the fact of this rate of change, it actually creates a healthier market for the future, right? I mean, for you guys, think about it, you know, just the compliance changes that are being a lot stricter, right? You know, these old ways of pretty much manually trading orders that are coming into the automated, connecting into fix, right? You know, better and faster settlement processes that are going through, you know, new trading functions as a collective, you know, it actually invites people to come into the market, right? And you can see that that pick on increase in turnovers there. But, you know, just, you know, Simon was saying, you know, concerns of this rate of change being fast for some people to adopt with such a constant turnover can actually be a very big concern, you know? You know, it could cause, but actually in most ways, it will cause errors that lead to negative PL for some people, right? And something that I'd say that, you know, for investors would shy away from coming to a market with that constant change, because, you know, I've seen a few people at the point that, you know, they've jumped into this excitement of the market and with all this rate of change, and they're not there, they get burned. And the next thing you know, they kind of shy away from that. So, you know, that kind of leaves it in the next question. Let's get in a little bit more detail here. There's one question that, you know, a lot of the market is asking for, you know, as MSCI starts to become a major thing here in India, right? You can see that the turnover, the inflow just alone for this, you know, November, 2023 is huge, right? And so, you know, coming from that MOC where most people participate, you know, as a market turnover picks up, do you feel that there's a need to talk about uh, market participant changes, such as maybe investing in a closing auction? Is that something that, you know, the exchange wants to, you know, maybe bring up as an idea or, you know, or is this something that is the path that they're going to bring up, you know? Yeah, definitely. In fact, uh, um, uh, on the rebalancing day, what majorly happens is uh, it increases higher liquidity and in some uh, uh, way, even the uh, volatility as well. So we have a pre-open session. So it, it is, uh, we can always look out for a close auction uh, session uh, during those particular days. It will definitely help the cause. I would agree as well. There have been discussions in the past. We haven't reached any conclusions, uh, but very happy to look at the suggestion and take it ahead. Simon, do you think there's something of a demand or a need for this one? Can you kind of elaborate on what you would see would be important for a closing auction here in India? If you just want to bring a brief, you don't have to. Look, um, I mean, I think there's growing interest to open, you know, the, the debate, the consultation on whether the market should adopt a closing auction. Um, it's certainly, um, you know, it, it becomes more of uh, daily or weekly conversations that, that I'm certainly involved with here in, in Hong Kong and with other FPIs. Um, it, we've got to remember that India's I think the only major equity market in the world not to have a closing auction. And, and although that in itself is not really a reason to implement uh, one, of course, um, I, I think it's kind of fair to say that other markets that have adopted a closing auction in the last few years, like Hong Kong and Indonesia, have witnessed a significant reduction in price volatility and increased volume uh, attracted at the closing price. Um, as a result of migrating to uh, a closing auction um, with the, you know, the, uh, you know, important, uh, robust attributes that constitute a, a, you know, a really good um, mechanism for 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 a close. Um, so look, I mean, I, I think um, you know, really opening up, um, uh, you know, to to a closing auction um, would would be you know, a good discussion point. I think it's important that you know, we need uh, the exchanges to probably lead the, the industry discussion because there's obviously lots and lots of different parties to, uh, to consult and, and seek views from. It's really important that the growing uh, local mutual fund uh, business industry and, and local brokers have the ability to express their views and, and, and everybody to, to be involved in an inclusive discussion here. Um, and of course, um, you know, what we've got to assess what is the retail, uh, the impact on retail investors. Um, I mean, I, I think in general, my, my perception is closing auctions are, are, are inclusive. Um, the benefit of them is that it, it provides a living profile because all participants 
can involve um, including retail investors be involved in a closing auction uh, and access that liquidity at the right price that they they wish to enter it in. So, you know, I think there's a lot of you know good benefits uh, to uh, that are in line with the principles of the Indian market that I understand. Um, so, you know, definitely would would uh, appreciate uh, the exchanges leading a, a discussion and and uh, engagement with SEBI to to help uh, you know, to 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 make a decision on whether to proceed. Um, and I think the industry is here to support in terms of helping provide the necessary data and, and um, you know, points of view that would be required to do that. Awesome, thank you, I appreciate it. Oops. You know, we have uh, an industry standards forum, ISS as we call it, in place in India now. This is uh, based on SEBI's request uh, to NSC and NSC is the secretariat of the industry standards forum. Any such ideas can be tabled at the Industry Standards Forum. Uh, we'll be very happy to receive your proposal. We'll place it in this forum. We will invite you to participate in the discussion when it happens. And uh, you know whatever happens at the Industry Standards Forum is minuted and sent to SEBI, the Capital Markets Regulator. And based on the recommendations of the ISS, uh, the Capital Markets Regulator is happy to take up anything uh, for actual implementation. So, so this is how we have to take this ahead. Uh, we welcome your, uh, you know, ideas. Maybe you could uh, lead this uh, initiative, uh, given that there are many like-minded uh, investors based outside of India. And based on that proposal, then we could have a discussion at the ISS. Awesome. I appreciate that. Um, okay, look, we're going to go back a little bit here. We're going to talk just quickly because just as we're pressed for time, uh, we just want to talk about extended trading hours. So, you know, um, we see the main opportunities here for the extended trading hours in India. Um, we know these extended hours to be maybe between 6 and 9 p.m. IST. Do we only see this on the derivative side? Do you think cash will be included? Can you guys give us a little bit of an update of what you guys would see from this? Okay. It's, it's uh, the National Stock Exchange that has submitted a proposal to SEBI for their consideration and approval. So I will go first on this. Uh, we have requested... Uh, a session between 6 p.m. and 9 p.m. only for equity derivatives and only for index derivatives uh, to start with. We could consider adding other products or we could alternatively consider extending the timeline from 9 p.m. to 11.55 p.m. at a later stage. But the proposal at the moment is only for a session between 6 p.m. and 9 p.m. and for index derivatives. That's, that's all we've asked for. Certainly not... Uh, not, not got anything to do with cash equities because the consultative process that we ran for about nine months clearly indicated to us that it's a big no, given that people have just sort of uh, settled down, I should say, after the T plus one settlement framework rollout. So this has nothing to do with the cash equity segment, only intended to provide a small window to the retail investors in India to hedge their portfolio risk should there be a global event that can potentially impact the Indian capital markets. So, uh, so is this a new in India? The answer is no. Uh, uh, the extended trading hours and longer trading durations are on in the commodities market since 2003, uh, late uh, December 2003, when markets is open at 9 o'clock. Uh, uh, the commodities market started opening now at 9 o'clock, earlier at 10 o'clock. So 9 o'clock in the morning till 11.30 and 11.55 as per the uh, US uh, uh, summer winter timings. Uh, so there is this continuous session happening in the commodities market. Uh, uh, they have uh, deliverable contracts traded out over there. But uh, on the equity front, yes, definitely uh, globally, if you look at the, the there are Globex markets, which are run 23 and a half hours a day. Half hours a day. And the, they are typically, basically though, the index products though. Uh, so uh, it would be very interesting to see whether, uh, how, the, how India will... Uh, look at it and how uh, India uh, will look at the trading of indices and uh, uh, notwithstanding the cash markets uh, should be on or uh, should be off at 3.30. So oh, it, it will be a wait and watch for us. Dave, do you have anything, questions you want to ask on this one? Just for my curiosity as well. Just what is it, how does this impact you guys just on a foreign institutional level if they were to extend derivative trading hours? Yeah, extending trading hours is a... Is it's a hot topic, actually, to be honest, because in the cash equity market, precedence has been set in a number of markets. Um, 
we've had Korea in the past, we've had Singapore in the past that have reduced their, removed their lunch hours uh, to try and see if we can stimulate a bit of liquidity growth. But ultimately what we found is that the slices get smaller, the buckets extend, but the overall liquidity landscape doesn't change. And in fact, when you look at the Philippines exchange through the COVID crisis, there was a 21 month period where the Philippines exchange has a number of other emerging exchanges shorted their trading hours. Philippines closed, it should have at 3 p.m. It closed at 1 p.m. Uh, some of the call will, will recall this. And in fact, when we look at liquidity across the shortened trading hour period, in fact, the Philippines saw 15% additional liquidity come through. So our argument's actually always been that you have to sort of uh, realize that uh, as a result of the significant systematic execution capabilities across the market from an institutional perspective, that the durational aspects of the trading day are not necessarily at the forefront of what generates additional incremental liquidity. Now, uh, off the back of what Sriram was saying, uh, the fact of extending a derivatives trading session may as well impact positively the ability for a retail investor to participate uh, post their own uh, working trading hours. And we are seeing a similar effect take place in Korea, where the FSC has approved uh, the preliminary approval of a, of a non-displayed venue that next trade is uh, going to operate an alternative trading system. Uh, and next trade are looking to implement a venue that will allow for the extended trading of securities in Korea beyond the cash equity close for the same reasons to entice retail investors to come to the market post the end of their working hours. So here again, you kind of need to separate the uh, aspects of the contributions of differing market participants to the overall uh, liquidity landscape. So we do acknowledge the fact that from a retail perspective, there is indeed opportunity if you are able to overlap with the ability for a retail investor to be engaged in uh, in, in, in the trading session. Uh, from an institutional perspective, the jury's out as to whether that will make any meaningful difference. Yeah. Simon, do you want to say anything or can I jump ahead here sure. because we're pressed to Oh yeah, go for it. Uh -huh. You know, no, uh, you, you can go ahead. I mean, I, I, I think the derivatives market makes uh, uh, a lot of sense. I think um, you know that uh, you know that, that's worth worth trying there. I, you know, there's obviously benefits for overlap into uh, European product that uh, trades India as well, and and uh, adding hedging abilities there in, in that time zone, of course. Um, so. Um, but yes, the cash market doesn't necessarily make any sense, and I kind of agree with David's comments there. And obviously, we've got to remember the uh, the constraints that we have uh, with OTR deadline at seven thirty, and uh, and safely settling our trades each day. And how do you how would that be compatible with extended hours? Exactly, I can what you mean. Just a quick question: Do we have potential that they would open the market earlier as well for derivatives? Is that something that you guys would be considered maybe you know an hour prior towards the actual cash market opens? Yeah, so you know the regulators have enabled the stock exchanges to extend trading hours till midnight. We thought, you know, let's first do the evening session, and once we are successful and comfortable, everybody is okay, then maybe we can look at an earlier start. Uh, so that was the thought process. But of course, you know, we can we can certainly you know go back if everybody is in favor of it, and and seek regulatory approvals. I guess that's something now we can talk about on the forums, you know when Simon wants to jump in and we can just send it as approval. So, okay, interesting. Sure. Okay, so I've got two more questions for you as we're very pressed for time at this point. So this, this is the first one, you know, I think we're just gonna throw in just the major question here for Gift City, right? So can you give us an update on Gift City in the terms of how this can help investors wanting a USD-based exposure to India, right? Both across potential FX uh, processes, efficiencies, and also possibilities of expanding product range for the international exchange in Gift City, right? And so I'll give a bit of both to you. So BSE, uh, BSE had the uh, BSE started the uh, first exchange uh, in the gift city called the India INX way back in 2017. Uh, launched on the 17th of Jan, 16th of Jan 2017 for trading. 
And uh, uh, the uniqueness of this entire ju jurisdiction, the Gift City IFSC, is that uh, the, all contracts traded and settled there in dollar terms. Uh, it's a tailor-made uh, jurisdiction for the foreign participants to come down and start trading there and uh, participate in these exchanges. Uh, we have an approval to go live for 23 and a half hours, but we go uh, we, we are tra uh, trading for 22 hours right from the uh, Tokyo Open to New York close in the morning, 4.30 to 2.30 at night. So we operate 22 hours a day. And uh, there are various, various initiatives uh, which were allowed there, as the, thanks to a earlier SEBI and now WIFSCA for those changes. Uh, the something similar to Omnibus account is also operative there. So it, it is a unique uh, proposition, uh, uh, apple to apple comparison in that sense um, uh, to compete with the other foreign jurisdictions like the Dubai and the Singapore at this point of time. So just to add to what uh, Samir was saying, the objective of setting up Gift City was multifold. Obviously, the biggest opportunity for banks who have set up international banking units in the Gift City space is that they can do FX conversions. And this includes non-deliverable forwards which typically used to happen outside of India until recently. Now we find non-deliverable forwards on the rupee happening from Gip City because many of the multinational banks have already set up in Gip City. The second thing that we started seeing is the bond listing, which now can happen from Gip City. The USD denominated bond listings don't necessarily have to happen in the London Stock Exchange or any other stock exchange outside of India. They can happen now in Gip City and we've started seeing many, many examples of that. Already, the total value of bonds listed and available on NSE International Exchange, for example, is in excess of about $70 billion. This includes green bonds, ESG bonds, so on and so forth. Thirdly, I think Indian banks uh, don't have, I'm talking about the private sector and public sector Indian banks, they necessarily don't have massive international presence, and therefore they can't be called international banks per se. And this has always been a challenge for them to expand their reach and, and lend to their own Indian clientele when they want to borrow in USD. Now that problem is addressed in a way because of Gift City being available as an option and banks are able to lend in USD terms from Gift City. Fourthly, with the movement of SGX Nifty and the fact that it's now available as Gift City on NSC International Exchange, Many Indian traders, brokers have set up shop in Gip City and all set to participate and add to the volumes that SGX used to see on uh, the Nifty Futures product. So that's that's like a huge boost for uh, the Gip City ecosystem at this point in time. And we can expect many more products to be launched on uh, the international exchange there. For example, recently the government has spoken about uh, you know overseas listing being permitted for startups even if they are not listed in India. Now, this is many. This is an option that many, many startups, particularly those who are close to being unicorns, uh, would like to avail of. And we can expect many uh, USD denominated listings to happen on the Gift City Exchange. And also there are you know, many, many companies uh, listed on the Indian stock exchanges. Now, we could have innovative products, like for example, the unsponsored depository receipts, based on the stocks available on the National Stock Exchange, for example, to be available on uh, the NSE International Exchange. There are also other products that uh, are being spoken about. The ecosystem is being improvised by the IFSC authority, that's the regulator at Gift City. So overall, lots of action at Gift City at this point in time, the infrastructure is building, and we can expect foreign investors to, uh, to draw on many of these advantages. And one other point that I also want to highlight is that offshore derivative instruments can now be issued from Gift City. Suppose an FPI is domiciled in Gift City. Uh, one, they are allowed to be domiciled in Gift City. And two, they can issue offshore derivative instruments from the FPI entity in Gift City. So these are all very, very important uh, milestone achievements and, and signs of progress. And therefore, there's a lot of hope and excitement. Said and just an update rather, uh, the India INX, the subsidiary of the BSE, also has a 
subsidiary called the India INX GA, which is the global access, which allows not only the uh, the broker members in, in present in the gift city IFSC, but also Indian investors who wish to invest in global stocks on global exchanges through uh, various uh, types that we have. And that allows you, the Indian investors, uh, to invest in global stocks in, uh, above, in over 135 destinations globally. Simon, is there anything you want to add into the questions for this one, just for your curiosity before I finish up? Sure. I mean, I, I, th I think um, Gift City in, in its entire is we're keeping a close eye on it. Um, we're interested um, and obviously want to understand how it will play a part in our in international investment uh, strategy. Um, I think, you know, it's been a very good start with the SGX uh, Nifty in its new home in terms of, I'm, I'm talking about our kind of involvement in there. I mean, the, um, you know, the, uh, it has been very so smooth, the liquidity is there, it's, uh, it's, it's settled in well. Um, I think, you know, in terms of products for the future that, you know, immediately in our world, uh, I think, you know, expansion of, of connect schemes i think is appropriate at the moment as um as you know more um you know just just to kind of help with the kind of connectivity uh to to this the city and single stock futures would be a natural um uh, addition i think uh, and would help i think international community and obviously any solutions around that kind of help de develop uh you know future odi um, um, uh, work obviously we, we know that that's not possible on shore at the moment so uh, anything that is uh, is possible to kind of develop from there but uh, really um, waiting for kind of and keeping an interested eye on and gives it as opposed to having anything really uh, particular to ask at the moment and this is relatively tight but I have one last question for you guys so this is just kind of on the sense of interportability so, you know, the kind of concept of being able to settle BSC, NSC in collection, is that something that could potentially happen? My additional question to that one is with Gift City coming around and, you know, they're building up this, you know, infrastructure, do we think that we could see a centralized clearinghouse? Well, I mean, today the facility already exists, as in the clearing member can choose where, which clearing corporation they want to settle all their transactions from. And therefore, it doesn't matter really where is the which is a trading venue, because all trades can be settled with the chosen clearing corporation already in India. And it's, it's a good idea to have two clearing corporations uh, just as a backup, you know, for one another. And uh, therefore, to answer your question, already the clearing and settlement is centralized with the chosen clearing corporation. And uh, that, that framework already works very well. Appreciate that one. Okay, uh, Dave, just to finish up, because I know we're short press on time, is there anything you want to highlight on your market structure presentation? Just a few brief things that we can do before we close up the session. You know, thank you very much. I guess my only final point would be, firstly on Gift City, it's a great indication of where regional and global markets are moving in terms of trying to work out a strategy for enticing investors to the market and expanding on the liquidity framework. And you can see that play out throughout global markets in terms of the levers and triggers that are being pulled to maintain relevance. Uh, so in India's case, you know, tax incentive structures, establishing free trade zones, pilot programs, not dissimilar to what China has historically done with China Next and Star Market uh, to create an incubatory proce process for providing sort of pilot program, so to speak. But you see throughout the regional markets, especially in emerging Asia, other triggers that are being reached and levers that are being pulled, lowering frictional cost of trading, you know, China dropping exchange levies, China and Hong Kong and Malaysia dropping stamp duty, Taiwan dropping transactional uh, taxes. These are all levers that can be pulled, uh, you know, I think from a perspective of attracting foreign investors, the foreign ownership relaxation measures were one of the most profound and most significant um, changes we've seen throughout the region that has benefited India uh, in the long run. Uh, from an organic uh, incremental pickup in liquidity, the China Connect scheme that has brought mainland investors into Hong Kong through Southbound Link has been significant as well. And I think that's probably the holy grail to try and find an organic segment of new liquidity to bring into the market. And finally, and probably most importantly, 
the enhanced listing regime measures to bring new unicorn, new economy companies into the market will really stabilize and bring new investor types into the market. So there's a number of levers and triggers that will be pulled over time. And we're quite excited by the number of strategies that uh, India Inc. is looking to implement that we believe will provide stability and a ubiquitous backbone of support to the market structure into the future. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's where we're at at the moment. Thank you for that, David. All right, guys, I think we're just out of time here. So we have about five minutes left for any questions that are in the crowd or within Slido. Do you have any questions? Hey, John, I take that initiative. I, I would represent the audience, in fact, uh, from that. First of all, thanks. Uh, it was a great, I think you covered everything, uh, John, from, from the point what market is looking for. And uh, both Simon and David, thanks for your input in terms of market liquidity. Uh, interoperability and uh, even with regarding to the um, you know the close auction which was very very important from the market perspective because the volumes that we are getting today and if with the um, uh, this close auction coming up we will get more of the content and the ETF flows coming to India. Uh, I would uh, I, with the time, uh, time constraint I will take up one or two questions. Uh, the first one was uh, uh, more going towards the exchanges. Will Lama reporting framework be extended to all the brokers? Uh, basically, it is a question where it is a, a retail and institution would be there, but uh, with the recent outages in uh, Zerodai and other brokers. So they're just checking if that framework will work with all the brokers. Well, I think it's an important concept. And you know, it's a, it's a mechanism by which uh, exchanges will constantly monitor and determine if there is any technical glitch at any of the broker uh, platforms. And if there is a technical glitch, then uh, suitable action can be taken up straight away rather than waiting for uh, a subsequent confirmation and reaction, if I have to put it in that way. So certainly, you know, the idea is to go live with everybody eventually. But I think to start with, we have identified a set of brokers with whom we will test this out. So we are well and truly going down that, that path. So what is important here uh, to understand is uh, the clients of those particular brokers who have been selected for this test run will be an, only be enabled to scare off the position and not to add any other positions. Okay, so it would be as similar to, so it won't differentiate or it will come into bracket for both the institutions and the, okay, fine. Uh, I would take the second question, probably that would be with, with the thing. Any specific regulation that govern the validation of the fundamental review of trading book, um, focusing particularly on the derivative desk and the institutions? I, I think, again, it goes to from the, if anybody can. I think, uh, other than that, it is all about. Uh, T plus zero and some which already been cleared. So I think we can stop it here. Thanks. I just want to say, look, I want to say thank you again for the NSC and to Shuram for having us and hosting us for such an amazing event. You know, we got through a lot of uh, interesting questions and we have almost 600 participants that actually are online listening to us now globally to, to understand things. I also want to thank the participants. I want to thank you for uh, Simon Williams. I want to thank David. And I want to thank um, Samir for being on this panel and giving us your insights on the market views and where you see for market structure. And I wanna also thank the audience for coming in and listening and asking certain questions. We will now be hosting an event just outside of the NSC here where we'll be having drinks and doing a bit of networking. And uh, yeah, if you guys wanna go, thank you guys again. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Thank you.